second category, which is art. He's going to talk about that water which is pure in of itself, but not purifying from other than itself. So Tahir is that which is changed due to pure substances entering into it. It's changed due to pure substances entering into it. And the change takes place in two ways. The first of them is that it changes the property of water, but not to extent that when you look at the water, you don't say it's water anymore. For example, rose petals fall into water, what would you call it? Rose water, right? But then the other way of changing the water, the Tahir water, for it to become Tahir, is that the pure water is used with something to an extent whereby the water now has changed completely. For example, for example, uh, meat has been cooked in the water. What's the situation there? It's not water anymore, right? It's soup. It's considered soup. So it's a complete change. So this, this is Tahir water, water now. Tahir water, water is, is that, that which changes, changes and it re retains its name as water or it's a complete change and it's now become something else and both of them you cannot use for Raf al hadith Zakallah khair Tayyib The Imam he says Bittabakh So this will happen, the Imam he says by cooking, right? The change from Tahir to Tahir will happen if something is cooked in it أو ساقتن فيه or if something pure falls into it and mixes with it right? but the exception here remember is if that pure thing is difficult to remove from the water like the leaves that we gave in the previous examples of Tahur the evidence the ulama they give for this that once something has mixed with it it becomes Tahir they say فَإِن لَمْ تَجِدُ مَاءً فَتَيَمَّمُوا صَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا the verse in Surah Ma'idah and elsewhere, that if you do not find water, right, then make tayammam with pure soil. فَإِن لَمْ تَجِدُ مَا If you do not find water. Water here in the verse is known as Ma'ul Mutlaq. Ma'ul Mutlaq. Ma'ul Mutlaq means unrestricted water. Its properties haven't changed, right? Ma'ul Mutlaq. So Allah is telling us if you do not find Ma'ul Mutlaq, you go to make tayammam, right? So if one of its properties have changed, then what is the ruling of the water? It's either going to be najis, and if it's not najis due to impurities, then it's going to be tahir. So this is what they're saying, all right? So that when things fall into the water and changes its properties, we know it's not najis because we're not talking about impure things falling into the water. We're talking about pure things mixing with the water. So it's not got its original properties anymore. It's not mal mutlaq. Therefore, it's tahir water. This is how the ulama they explain this issue. أو رفع أو رفع بقليله حدث or this water is طاهر when it's a little amount. What's a little amount of water? Less than قلتين. If it's a little amount of water and it's used to remove حدث. What's حدث? Not impurity. Hadith is that which happens if you break your wudu or you need to make ghusl, right? In an in a easy explanation. So it's that state that you're in wherein you need to make wudu or you need to make ghusl, okay? So if you have a little bit of water and you use it to remove hadith, then the water becomes now tahir water, okay? And what they're referring to, the water, they mean ma'ul mutasaqit. Ma'ul mutasaqit means the water which is coming off from the body parts after having used it for wudu or ghusl. So if that water comes off and it's collected in a container, now this water cannot be used again to remove hadith. Okay, it cannot be used for purification. Why? Because it was used in the removal of hadith. So once and a small amount of water is used in the removal of hadith, whether it's for wudu or ghusl, and that water is collected from the body parts, that cannot be used again for the removal of najasa or hadith according to the author. So the Imam, he quote the, the evidence for this, they say, is the hadith in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, Do not make ghusl in, ma, in water which is not running whilst you are in state of janaba. Janaba means sexual impurity. That thing which you need to make ghusl for, right? So if you're in that state, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, do not go into the water which is stagnant and make ghusl. So they say this is a proof 
that the water, if you use it for removing hadith, it now becomes tahir. Why? Because the Prophet would not have said this had there not been an effect on the water. So there's a definite clear effect on the water. That's the meaning of the words of the Prophet ﷺ in this hadith. It removes, it removes the tuhuriya, the pur purifying properties of the water. The tuhuriya, which means purifying properties of the water. Another reason or another type of tahir water, the Imam he says, أَوْهُمِسَ فِيهِ يَدُّ قَائِمٍ مِن نَوْمِ لَيْلٍ نَاقِدٍ لِلْوُضُوءِ Okay? Or a person dips his hand into the water after having woken up from sleep at night. And this is a sleep that breaks the wudu. So before we get into the ruling, you can see in this uh, statement that there's quite a few qiyud. Remember we said qiyud are those things which are known as restrictions for implementing the ruling. So these restrictions have to be there for the ruling to take place. Right? So how many qiyud are mentioned in this sentence that the Imam said? What's the first of them? What's the first thing that should happen? The hand has to fully be in the water. So if somebody just put their fingers in that water, right? Then this ruling is not taking place for that person. So the hand has to fully be in there. What else? What else did he mention? Look at the sentence. Wake up from deep sleep. So the brother mentioned it perfectly. He said deep sleep, right? But deep sleep when? At night, okay? Deep sleep at night. So it's not just any sleep, like when you can tell what's going on around you. It has to be a deep sleep. Why? Because the Imam, he said, naqid lil wudu. That sleep which breaks the wudu. And the sleep which breaks the wudu is the deep sleep. So these are the qiyud, right? And the evidence is in the hadith in Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا سَيْقَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ مِنْ نَوْمِهِ فَلَا يَغْمِسْ يَدَهُ فِي الْإِنَا حَتَّى يَغْسِلَهَا ثَلَاثِ that if one of you wakes up from the deep sleep at night, then do not put his hand into the vessel until you wash it three times. Wash what? Wash your hand three times. For verily, he doesn't know where his hand has been. So they say this hadith, the prohibition, it has an effect. What is the effect? It's going to make the water tahir. We know it's not going to make it najis, so we say it's going to make the water tahir. And the ulama, they said, especially in the olden times when there wasn't so much water available. People used to wash themselves after going to the bathroom, but there still, still used to be some trace of najasa left. And maybe a person at night touched that trace of najasa, and then if he puts his hand with that najasa into a small amount of water, this will take it away from being uh, purifying and make it tahir. This maslaha is known as uh, from the mufradat of the madhab. Mufradat of the madhab means an opinion which is peculiar to this madhab. No other of the ulama from the madhab shared this opinion, right? So it's a peculiar opinion to the Hanbali scholars, which doesn't necessitate that it's a weak opinion in any way, shape or form. The Imam, he says next, which page are we on? So you guys are with me. Tayyib. The Imam, he says next, أو كان آخر غسلة زالت النجاسة بها فطاهر or if it's the last washing from the seven washings which you are using to remove a najasa from then it is tahir so for example you have a dish on that dish there was something impure you have to wash it seven times right with water for it to be removed this is the opinion of the madhab that you, every impurity you have to wash it seven times minimum so in this situation, you've come to the sixth washing now, okay? And you've removed the essence of the najasa. And in the seventh washing, they say that this washing now, the seventh one, is being used to completely remove the najas najasa now. So it's considered as being tahir due to that reason. Because it was used, like previously we said, small amount of water which is used for raising of hadith, Okay, it becomes tahir, right? Likewise, a small amount of water which is used for removing the najasa also becomes tahir. Why do we say it's not impure? Because we said that if it's a small amount of water and it touches impurity, automatically it becomes impure. We say it's not impure but tahir because it's the seventh washing. The najasa has already been removed. This is counted as the one which removes the najasa. So it's, it's the one which is given the ruling 
as being ma'ul musta'mal, used water in the removal of najasa and therefore it's given the ruling of tahir. Another opinion in the madhab held by Ibn Taymiyyah and others is that in these issues there's only two things you have to consider. One is the water is either pure or it's impure. Okay, this is another opinion held by some of the scholars in the madhab that if it's been changed, the properties of the water have been changed with a small or large amount of water and it's been changed due to impurity, then we give it a ruling as impure. If the small or large amount of water has not been changed, its properties, then it remains pure. This is another opinion, right? The author now, he's going to mention three situations where the water can become najas. He's finished with tahir water. He's going to mention three situations when the water can become najas, impure water, right? Najas, the word najas, it can be said with a fatha, najas, can be said with a kasra, najas, it can be said with a sukun, najs. All of them are correct. When najsu ma taghayyira bi najasatin. Najasa is that which has been changed due to having an impurity falling into it. Is this large amount of water or small amount of water? Huh? So again, najis, what did he say? Najis is changed, is that water which is changed due to impurity. Is this large amount of water or small amount of water? Either, both, right? It, it, because the property is changing. If the property is changed even in the large amount of water, then it becomes impure. So Imam Ibn Mundhir in his book Al-Ijma'ah, uh, the consensus, he said that the ulama agreed upon this, that if the water changes uh, its characteristics due to impurity, then it is considered and ruled as being impure. Tayyib? So if somebody asks you, what's the, what's the proof for this? What do you say? Do you take it from the Quran or the Hadith? Where do you take it from? Huh? The consensus of the ulama, which is also a proof amongst uh, the shara'i proofs in our deen. So the imam, the first thing he says, if the water changes due to an impurity, it becomes impure. The second thing he's saying now, أو لا يقاها وهو يسير Or it touches, the impurity touches the water, meets with the water, whilst the water is a little amount, less than qullatain. Whilst the water is a little amount, less than qullatain. Where did they get this from? The evidence. They got it from the hadith we took last week of Qullatain, if you remember it. The Prophet said, That when water reaches this amount of being Qullatain, it doesn't carry Najasa. It doesn't get affected by impurity, right? That's what they said, yeah? And that's what we said. So now, that is the mantuq. Known as mantuq means the statement of the Prophet the spoken ruling. There's something called the mafhum, which is the deduction from a ruling. The deduction from the words of the Prophet ﷺ. So the mafhum of this hadith is that if it's less than qullatain, then the najasa enters it, it will become impure. So again, the Prophet ﷺ is saying that if the water is qullatain, a large amount, it doesn't become impure by having impurity in it. Right? Exception if the properties change. So the mafhum, the deduction from the hadith, the understanding that can be extrapolated from the hadith, the mafhum, is that if it's less than qullatain, then it's going to be affected by the najasa, right? <clears throat> Ibn Taymiyyah and a few others in the madhab, they said uh, again that it's only if the properties change due to najasa. And one of the evidences they have for this is the hadith collected by Imam Bayhaqi and Imam Ibn Majah, where the Prophet ﷺ was asked about Bir al-Buda'a. Bir al-Buda'a was a well, well known in Medina. And when the floods would come, the floods would carry lots of impurities from the streets and it would be thrown into that well, taken by the floods. So the Sahaba, they asked the Prophet ﷺ about this well. Can we use this water, etc. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna al ma la yunajjisuhu shay. That verily water, nothing makes it impure. So nothing makes the water impure except for that which was agreed upon if one of the properties change, right? So this is the second opinion, another opinion in the madhab. And those who hold this opinion, they say that the mantuq, the mantuq is the spoken words, right? 
is stronger than the mafhum, is stronger than the deduction. And this is a rule in fiqh. إِذَا تَعَارَضَ الْمَنْتُوقُ وَالْمَفْحُومُ قُدِّمَا الْمَنْتُوقُ إِذَا تَعَارَضَ الْمَنْتُوقُ وَالْمَفْحُومُ قُدِّمَا الْمَنْتُوقُ That if there is a contradiction or a clash between the spoken word and the deduction in different ahadith, then the spoken word on that situation, on that topic, takes precedence, right? The Imam gives another example of how water can become impure. He said, أَوْ إِنْ فَصَلَ عَنْ مَحَلِّ نَجَاسَةٍ قَبْلَ زَوَالِهَا He said, What's the translation here? Or, um, or the water comes off the place which has najasa on it before the najasa is removed. So you're washing a carpet, for example, that has najasa on it, right? So as you're washing the water, before the water is removed, before the najasa is removed, what's happening to the water? It's touching the najasa being a little amount. Therefore, the Najasa, therefore the water is being affected by the Najasa. Why? Because it's a little amount and as long as the Najasa is there and it's touching the little amount of Najasa or the amount of Najasa, then it's becoming impure. Tayyib. Now the Imam is going to mention after how Najasa, how the Najasa affects the water, he's going to mention now, how do we purify this water? Is it possible to purify this impure water? So he says, فَإِنْ أُضِيفَ إِلَى الْمَاءِ النَّجِسِ طَهُورٌ كَثِيرٌ غَيْرُ تُرَابٍ وَنَحْوِهِ If you combine with this water which is najis, lots of pure water, other than turab, other than using soil like sand, and it's like, then it will become pure. What does he mean here? Excellent. So the Imam is telling us that if you have water which is more than qullatain, right, and you add it to the impure water, and the najasa now is removed due to that additional water, then it becomes pure. Why did he make the condition of it has to be more than qullatain? Taib, you're on the right path. The, the thing is that if it's a little amount of water, then as soon as it touches the najasa, it's just going to become najas. It just adds to the problem. So likewise, that's a, when the, they say when you add the qullatain, it cannot be bucket by bucket because that means you're adding little amount to that najas water and it's just becoming najas after najas. So it has to be added in one go, right? So that's why he said it has to be a large amount of water. <clears throat> he mentioned also that you cannot use turab, you cannot use the pure earth to purify the water, right? The reason they mentioned this, they said that the turab لا يدافئ النجاسة عن نفسه فمن باب الأولى لا يدافئ عن غيره That this turab, it doesn't push away the najasa from itself. So from, from, from more so, من باب الأولى, it's not going to push it away from other than it. Right? And Ibn Aqil from the Hanbali scholars, he said another reason is that in fact the turab, it just hides the najasa. It just covers it. It doesn't really remove it. If you were to dig under it, you would still find the najasa there. It's not really removed. It just hides the smell and the effect, etc. Ibn Taymiyyah and others in the Madhab, they said, no. However, the najasa is removed, then that is well and good as a ruling. Why? Does anyone know why? Why the other opinion? The, huh? Exactly. Al-Hukm, like we said, yaduru ma'illatihi wujudun wa'adman. That the ruling revolves around its cause. Present or not present. So the cause for the impurity, if it's removed, then the ruling is going to be removed. So however, according, however the impurity is removed, according to the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah, then that's well and good, the ruling will be removed of impure. However, our author and those of the madhab, they said, no, you cannot use turab for the reasons that we gave. The Imam, he gives another example. He says, Or oh, oh, you have a large amount of water. In it, it's impure because its properties have changed due to impurities. But then over time, you come back a month later, you pass that water by and all of a sudden it's pure. How could that have happened? Evaporation, the wind blowing the impurity away. So if it changes by itself, then you have the ruling that it's pure. Again, going back to that, what we just said a few moments ago. If the impurity is removed, then the ru ruling is removed, okay? So this is what the imam, the author, he means here. 
Or he says, أَوْ نُزِحَ مِنْهُ فَبَقِيَ بَعْدَهُ كَثِيرٌ غَيْرُ مُتَغَيِّرٍ طَهُورٌ Or, you have a large amount of water which is قُلَّتَيْن You drain the impure water from it, however you do that. And after you've done that, then more than قُلَّتَيْن amount of water, which is pure, remains. Yeah? So it's done by draining. So you probably, let's say you had, uh, you know, قُلَّتَيْن times three. Right? So you removed qullatain worth of water which had najis on it. After that now you have qullatain times two left and all that water is pure, that's well and good. Due to the same principle. If the, if the impurity is removed, then the ruling is removed, right? This is what the Imam is saying. If you can hold your questions to the end, that's better. Unless it's uh, imperative for you to ask, then by all means ask it, inshallah. The Imam, he says, now he's moving to something else pertaining to impurities. Uh, a big rule. He said, وَإِن شَكَّ فِي نَجَاسَةِ مَاءٍ أَوْ غَيْرِهِ أَوْ طَهَارَاتِهِ بَنَا عَلَى الْيَقِينِ He said, if the person has a doubt as to the purity or impurity of water or other than water, then he has to act upon certainty. So you come across something like water. You have doubt. Is it pure? Is it impure? You come across carpet. Is it pure? Is it impure? Right? What do you do? You act upon certainty. If you, and, and doubt is where it can be 50-50. That is the meaning of shak. Shak is where it can be 50-50. So this is what the Imam is talking about. If you have doubt, 50-50, you're not sure, then you base it upon certainty. So you come to a situation where you knew that the water was pure, but later on you had shak. Did some impurity enter it or not? Let's say, for example, you have um, a small amount of water and you have dogs walking near the water. You didn't see the dog yourself licking the water but now that's giving you a doubt did the water become impure or not you knew an hour ago an hour ago before the dogs were there the water was pure so what do you do there's no proof that it became impure so you cannot listen to the doubt you throw away the doubt and you build upon certainty certainty was that you knew an hour ago that it was pure likewise the opposite example right if you knew that the water was uh, impure but now for some reason you've come across it again and you're having doubt, is it pure or is it impure? You build upon the certainty which was before you knew it to be impure. طيب, here's the third scenario. If you come across the water, you're not sure, is it impure or pure? You have no recollection whatsoever. What do you do in this situation? You go with that it's pure. Why? Because that is the asal of water. The asal, the, the foundation principle pertaining to water, its original affair, its original ruling is that it's pure. Okay? The, Afwan? Because this is a situation of shak, there's no qarina, there's nothing telling you that through taste or smell or look, that's why we have the doubt, right? If there was some, uh, something showing us, then we would rule it as being either pure or impure. But this is a situation where you're in doubt, right? So it's not applied only to water. This is applied to everything, okay? Any situation where you're in doubt whether it's pure or it's impure, like the carpet example I gave you. Tayyib, what is this based on? This is based on Al-Qaidatu Al-Fiqhiyatu Al-Kubra. The, one of the uh, major legal maxims in Islam, which is that Al-Yaqeen La Yazulu Bishak, that Certainty is not removed due to doubt. Certainty is not removed due to doubt. This is one of the major legal maxims in Islam. And it's taken from the hadith in Bukhari of Abdullah ibn Zaydin radiyallahu anhu where he said, Shukya illa Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a rajul a rajul yukhayya lu Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la hatta Abdullah ibn Zayd in Bukhari, he says it was mentioned to the Prophet ﷺ that a person complained about some movement he found in his stomach. So the Prophet ﷺ said, tell him not to move from the salah, not to leave the salah until he clearly hears a sound or clearly smells a smell. Meaning that he shouldn't base any ruling based upon doubt. Only on that which is certain. Okay? So this is a mercy from Allah to us in our deen, that we base everything upon certainty. We don't listen to what's worse. We don't listen to whisperings, which a lot of people sadly are affected by. The Imam, he says, 
Here, the Imam is saying that if you have a situation where impure water is confused with pure water, you're not allowed to use any of them. So for example, in your storage room, you have no water tanks, like you're living in a poor country where they don't have water tanks. You have a storage vessel, two of them. One is impure water, one is pure water. Right? Your kids came and they took the labels off. Now you're completely confused as to which is which. What do you do? The Imam here says, you do not use either of them. Okay? You do not use either of them. What do you do then? If you, don't, if you cannot use either of them? No. You make tayammum, right? And why cannot you use either of them? Because here we're not sure which one is pure and which one is impure. We don't want to make wudu with impure water. In fact, you're not allowed to make wudu with impure water. So due to the doubt, we're not allowed to use either of them, either container, right? And we have to go to tayammum. In this situation now, do we have to... When do you make tayammum? When are you allowed to make tayammum? When you... When you don't have water, right? Then you can make tayammum. But here you have water in front of you. So some ulama, they say you have to spill the water. Spill the water to enable you to fall under the category of those who can make tayammum. Sheikh Khalid, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Khalid and others explaining this book, they said no, you don't have to spill the water. Why do you think they said no, you don't have to spill the water before you make tayammum? Wasting is one of the points, but something a bit more stronger. Yeah. Ahsant, because here, though you have water physically, but as a ruling, it's not present. Right? Because the ruling is that you cannot use these waters due to the confusion that's taking place. So even though the water is present, the ruling is given that it's not present because you're not allowed to use it. Zakallah khair. Now. If one was qullatayn and above, then you can mix them, yes. This, this situation wouldn't arise in the situation of qullatayn because they say qullatayn is always going to be uh, pure unless we see clear impurity in it. طيب. So the Imam says, وَلَا يُسْتَرَطُوا لِتَيَمُّمِ إِرَاقَتُهُمَا وَلَا خَلْتُهُمَا And we've discussed this. The Imam said, the author said, it's not conditional for you to make tayammum that you spill the water or that you mix the water. So, now the Imam, the author, he's going to give another example of confusion. He said, He said, if you have another situation, we have pure water, tahur water in a vessel, and you have tahir water in a vessel. But now again, you're confused. Your kids, they took the labels off. Don't take the labels off, okay? The kids, they took the labels off. What do you do in this situation? He said, you make wudu from each of them. What does he mean you make wudu from each of them? How? Someone else. Yes. You make wudu using the first one and then you make wudu using the second one. That's a possibility. I want some, another possibility. You mix the water? No. You're not allowed to mix the water. You alternate. You alternate. Why? Because the brother here, he said he ma you make a full wudu based on one, right? But this is you're making wudu based upon doubt. You're not sure. Is this the pure water or is this the tahir water? So you're not allowed to make a full wudu from one, from either of the vessels. But however, if you washed once from this uh, a body part and once from this a body part and you did that throughout your wudu, then you have no doubt in the fact that you know that your wudu was made correctly. Okay? That's the difference in, in the uh, mas'ala here. And of course, if you hold the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah and others, then this mas'ala doesn't affect you because they said water is only of two types. طيب. The Imam he says, When ishtabahat thiyabun tahiratun bi najisatin aw bi muharramatin salla fi kulli thawbin salatan bi adad najis aw al muharram wa zada salah. If you have a situation of confusion where you have thobes which are pure and you have thobes which are impure, but now you're confused as to which is which. Or you have thobes which are halal and thobes which are not halal. Some people they like stealing clothes, right? 
So this person, even though he's stealing clothes, he still wants to pray, mashallah, tabarakallah, which is a good thing, right? It may lead them to stop stealing. But now he's confused. He knows the ruling. Like, I'm not allowed to pray, pray in stolen clothing, but he's confused which is which. So what does the person do in this situation? The Imam, he says, that you pray in the number of thobes which you knew to be impure or stolen and you increase in one prayer. Why? Because probabilistically, if that's a word, that will mean that you have prayed in a thob which is pure or not stolen. So say, for example, you have five thobes, right? You knew that three of them are impure. But now you can't find, you can't smell, you can't see the stain of which one is impure. You knew your child somehow made three of them impure, right? And there's five. So the Imam is saying, pray in any three thobes, the amount of najas thobes, and then increase one more prayer in another thobe. So you end up praying four. So probabilistically, is that a word? Probabilistically, you end up... <laughs> It sounds good though. Probabilistically, you end up uh, praying in a thobe which is pure or not stolen. This is of course in a situation where you do not have other thobes or in a situation where you do not have ability to wash quickly in the washer and dry before the time of prayer passes you by. And we come now with that to Babul Aniya, the next chapter which is pertaining to the chapter of vessels. Babul Aniya, the chapter now pertaining to vessels. Why is the Imam, after speaking about water in its different categories, talking about vessels? Vessels meaning containers, etc. Very good. Because the water has to be put in a place, and we have to ensure that the place that we put the water in is not impure, because that will then make the water impure if it's less than qullatayn. So Aniya, Babul Aniya, is the, Aniya is the plural of Ina, meaning vessels, right? And there are a variety of different types. What does Allah say in the Quran? In Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created for you everything on the earth, meaning created for your use. So the asal of Asha, the asal of things, the original ruling of things is that everything is permissible for you. When does it become impermissible? If the Sharia now comes and restricts it for you, right? So any vessel for you, its original state, its original ruling is that it's allowed for you to use. Unless the Sharia says to you, X, Y, and Z, pertaining to different characteristics and properties. So the Imam, he says, excuse me, Kullu ina in tahir. Every vessel is pure. Walaw thaminan, even if it's expensive. Yubahu, yubahu ittikhaduhu wa isti'maluhu It's permissible for you to take it and to use it. Okay? Ittikhad, this word ittikhad means that you take it and you have it left around the house. Either for decoration, either for investment, these expensive vessels, right? Gold plated or whatever it may be. And isti'mal is to use it for the thing which it's created for. To use it to, for, its, for its purpose, right? So our author, he's saying that every vessel is pure, even if it's expensive. And it's permissible for you to take it and for you to use it. The word here, low, he said, low thaminan. Low, generally, the ulama, they put this word here for a purpose. You know, the ulama, they don't write without thinking about every single word. They, they choose the words that they use. Low means even. Even, right? In English, you can translate it. And it gives the meaning of ikhtilaf. It gives the meaning to show that there's a difference of opinion here. And there is a difference of opinion because some of the ulama, they said that that which is thameen, that which is valuable, even that should not be used. Why? Because they say it's israf, it's a waste of money, and it's kasratul qulub al-fuqara. It breaks the hearts of the poor people when they come to visit you. Okay, so that is a, a, a side point. So our imam, he's saying that all vessels are allowed to use even if they are expensive. Now here's an exception. He says, "Illa aniyat dhahab wal fidda," except for a vessel which is made of gold or silver, wa mudabban bihima, or it is it, it contains soldering. Soldering meaning uh, soldering is something where you heat up a you heat up a substance and you use it to join something together. Okay, so if you use gold or silver to join a vessel which is broken together, this is also impermissible. So the Imam is saying that vessels of gold and silver are imp impermissible, as well as vessels which have soldering from gold and silver. They are also impermissible. 
فإنه يحرم اتخاذها واستعمالها ولو على أنثى. So this situation is impermissible to take it. Take it means have it in your house but not use it. Or even to use it. Remember we said اتخاذ is that you have it in the house as an investment or a decoration or something of that nature. استعمال is to actually use it for its purpose. So these vessels which are gold and silver or anything soldered with gold and silver, you're not allowed to either take it or to use it, right? Not allowed to take it or use it. Why, did you th why do you think they said you can't even take it? Al-wasail laha ahkam al maqasid The wasail, the means, they have the ruling of the objective, right? So if the objective is haram, that which leads to the haram is also haram. So by you having it in your house, over time you're going to end up using it, right? So that which leads to haram is also haram. That's why they say you cannot even have it in your house as ittikhad, right? Because it will lead to isti'mal. So the hadith is in Bukhari, the hadith of Hudayfa radiyallahu anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu said, لا تشربوا في آنية الذهب والفضة ولا تأكلوا في صحافها فإنها لهم في الدنيا ولكم في الآخرة. Do not eat or drink in the vessels of gold and silver, for verily they are for them, meaning the non-Muslims in the dunya, and for you in the akhirah. And for you guys, the believers, in the akhirah. May Allah make us from them. Imam al Qutni, one of the hadith scholars, he has a narration where it says, even vessels which have anything contained from gold and silver on them. Okay? أو إناء فيه شيء من ذلك So even vessels which contain anything from gold and silver are not allowed. So the ruling of not being allowed to use vessels of gold and silver, even if they're soldered, is clear now, right? With gold and silver. Even if it's gold plated with, with gold or silver. Even if, it has, even if it's dipped, what's it called when you dip it and it takes the color? Huh? Okay, that gold plated, etc., right? So even if it's that situation, it's not allowed. The Imam, and this is the opinion of the Jumhur ulama, the majority of the ulama. This opinion of the majority of the ulama. And Sheikh Ahmed Khalil is in explanation, he gives a good point here for us as students of knowledge. And Sheikh Uthaymin mentions this elsewhere also. He says, if you come across a situation where you know that this ruling is the Jumhur, then don't leave it easily. And you look at it again and again and again before you leave it. Because by virtue that the majority of the ulama, the thousands of ulama have agreed upon this, then for you to leave that, you should be very cautious in doing so. We're not saying that it's wrong for you to leave it, but be very cautious in doing so. طيب. So anyway, the Imam, he says, after establishing that these vessels are not allowed, he says, minha. But if you made wudu from a vessel of gold and silver, or anything that contained gold and silver, your tahara is accepted for you. Your tahara is valid. It's not going to be invalid. What do we need to add to this, though, to this statement? There's something needs to be added here. No. Well, no. So, the Imam, he says that your purification made from these haram vessels will be valid. Right? What do we need to add to the statement of the Imam? Something needs to be added here. I can't hear you, sorry. No, no necessity. Because there's not a necessity. You can go outside in the rain and make wudu in the rain. You can, there's not really a situation where I can think of a necessity here. Yes, ahsant, barakallahu feek. You have to make tawbah, right? You have to make istighfar. Because now the person has done something that which is sinful. So though your purity is going to be accepted, you have to make istighfar from Allah for having done that. Why is your purity accepted from that which is forbidden? Because this forbidden vessel, لا يرجع إلى ذات الإبادة It doesn't return to the actual act of worship itself in terms of the act of worship or its conditions. So from the conditions of making wudu is not that you have to make wudu from a vessel. Like I said, you can go outside and make wudu from the rain. So the, the, the purity of the vessel, the, the permissibility of the vessel is not part of the act of the wudu. It's like a person praying, he has to ensure that his clothing is pure, right? That returns to the act of worship itself. But if he was to wear a gold ring, his prayer would still be valid, but he's sinful for wearing the gold ring. Similar is this situation. طيب. 
the Imam, he says, إِلَّا ضَبَّةً يَصِيرَةً مِنْ فِضَّةٍ لِلْحَاجَةً Except for a small amount which is soldered from silver due to a need. So an exception to the rules that we just gave about the impermissibility of these vessels, the exception is that you can have gold or silver, a little amount, for soldering. Am I right? I said something wrong to see who would correct me. I said, what's the correct? Only silver. Jazakallah khair. So here, this is the istithna. Istithna means the exception. Istithna from the hukum. This is istithna from the ruling, right? Which is that if there is a vessel which has a little bit of silver and it's there for a need, okay, then it's allowed to be used. And what is the silver there for? It's not there for decoration. It's there for soldering, to join the parts together. And this is taken from the hadith in Bukhari where Anas radiyallahu anhu, he said, that the vessel of the Prophet ﷺ broke and the Prophet ﷺ took a piece of silver and soldered it together, right? So this is a proof that in this situation you can use it. And Imam Bukhari, he, saw, he said, I, I came across this vessel and I drank from it when I was in. Basra, as mentioned by Mutlaq Jasr in his explanation. The Imam he says, And it's disliked, it's makru disliked to touch the place where the silver is unless there is a need. Why? So you fixed your vessel now with a bit of silver. The Imam is telling you it's disliked to drink from that part where the silver is unless there's a need. Why? Because then it becomes isti'mal. Right? Because then it becomes usage of a vessel which has silver on it, which we said is forbidden. Unless there's a need, okay? If there's a need, then the rule in fiqh is Al-Hajat Tadfa'u Karahat. Al-Hajat needs push away uh, the ruling of something being makru, disliked. So if there's a need like the other parts of the vessel are hot and this part with the silver is cool and that's where you can drink from only, then you can go ahead and do so. Because al-hajat, the needs push away the ruling of karahat, of that which is disliked. The Imam, he says, وَتُبَاهُ آنِيَةُ الْقُفَّارِ And it's permissible for you to use the vessels of the kuffar, the kuffar, as long as they're not from the categories which we've just mentioned. وَلَوْ لَمْ تَحِلْ ذَبَائِحُهُمْ Even if it's from the kuffar, whose food is not permissible for you, like the mushrikeen, etc., right? Like the mushrikeen, etc. Because in the hadith of Abi Dawood, Jabir radiallahu anhu, he said, Kunna nagzu ma'a Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fanasibu min aniyatil mushrikeen wa asqiyatihim, fanastam ta'u biha, fala yu ibu dalika alayna. Jabir radiallahu anhu, he said, as in Abi Dawood and others, he said, We used to be in battles with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we would come across the vessels and the, uh, the watering jugs of the mushrikeen. And we would use them and the Prophet ﷺ never used to look down upon that. طيب? So it's permissible for you, us to use the vessels of the non-Muslims. Any conditions here? Apart from the ones that we've already mentioned. You're allowed to use the vessels of the kuffar, right? As long as it's not gold and silver. If it's not filthy, it doesn't have any impurity. If you know, for example, that those people they're known to drink alcohol in those vessels, they're known to eat the uh, pig, etc. Then you cannot use them until you wash them. Okay, as mentioned in the hadith of Abi Tha'lab al-Khushani, where the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِن لَمْ تَجْدُ أَنْهَا بُدْ فَغْسِلُوهَا That if you do not find other than those vessels, then wash them. Meaning wash them before you use them to remove the impurities. طيب. Uh, the Imam, he says, وَثِيَابُهُمْ إِنْ جُهِلَ حَالُهَا and also permissible for you is the clothing of the kuffar if you do not know about the situation of this clothing. Meaning, if you do not know them to be impure or made from that which is haram, then you are allowed to use it. Okay? Because in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, in Bukhari Muslim, she said, Kufina and Nabi sallallahu alayhi fi athwab bidin sahuliyatin. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was buried in three uh, pieces of clothing from Suhuliya. Suhuliya was a, Suhul was a, is a place in Yemen. In that time, it used to be uh, occupied by the non-Muslims, by the Ahlul Kitab. Okay, so obviously this clothing, this shrouding or this clothing came 
from, from the non-Muslims. So the hadith is in Bukhari. So this shows us that you can use their clothing also. Again, what's the rulings? What do we have to add here? What do we have to be aware of? Like I said, as long as you know, it, it's not impure. If it's impure and we know that, then we cannot use it until we wash it seven times, right? If it's made from something impure, then of course you cannot uh, use it. If you, if you do not know the situation of the clothing, whether it's pure or impure, what do you do then? What's the ruling then? Pure. Why is it pure? Because we said that verse in the Quran, right? Surah Baqarah, Allah is the one who created for you everything. So everything is pure unless you have proof to show that it's impure, right? So the clothing is considered as pure until shown to be impure. The Imam he says, وَلَا يَطْهُرُ جِلْدُ مَيْتَةٍ بِالْدِبَاغِ And the dead animal's skin is not purified through tanning. Tanning is a, um, is a method which people use to wash and to remove the impurities from the skin of the dead animal before they use it. So this is also from the Mufradat of the Hanabila. It's from the peculiar um, ruling of the Hanabila, which is that they say you cannot use whatsoever any type of skin from any animal, even if it's been tanned, okay? Even if it's been tanned any way, shape or form. And again, though it's from the Mufrad that it doesn't in any way, shape or form mean that it's a weak opinion. So, Al-Khamsa, they narrate, who is Khamsa? When we say Al-Khamsa? Yeah. Five, but who? <laughs> yeah, Sunnah Al-Khamsa, who are they? So in the Khamsa we have the hadith of Abdullah ibn Uqaym Abdullah ibn Uqaym radiyallahu anhu who said Kataba ilayna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qabla wafati bi shahrin Alla tantafi'u min al-maytati bi ihabin wa la asab That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wrote to us before his death by a month or so saying do not benefit from the dead animal from its skin or its asab Asab is something between the bone and the muscle. So he said, do not, so the hadith is saying, do not benefit from the skin of the dead animal in this narration, right? And Imam Ahmad took this narration to be nasikh for the other narrations which indicate that you can use the skin of the dead animal, right? Why did you take this as being nasikh, as being that which repeals the other rulings? Because this was the last ruling that the Prophet ﷺ gave pertaining to the matter, right? So the Imam he says, "Wa yubahu istimaluhu بعد دبخ في يابس من حيوان طاهر في الحياة." However, after having established the ruling, he says, "If the animal was pure in life, and you tanned the skin after the death of the animal, then it's permissible for you to now use that skin in that which is dry. You can use it as a container to carry that which is dry, not wet. Why?" Why can you use it? Why is he giving this exception that you can use it now as a vessel to carry that which is dry and not wet? Be exactly, the liquid uh, carries the najasa. Dry stuff won't carry the najasa, right? So if you use it as a container for dry stuff, it won't get najas. But you use it for liquid, it will get najas. Tayyib? And Ibn Taymiyyah and Uthaymin from some of the Hanbali scholars, another smaller opinion, lesser opinion, is that they say any animal which is permissible for you to eat in life, is tahir, that when it dies, if you tan it, then the skin is permissible for to use in all, all situations. The Imam, he says, وَلَبْنُهَا وَكُلُّ أَجْزَائِهَا نَجِسَةٌ I think we'll stop here, inshallah. See, people are getting tired, inshallah. Inshallah, we'll stop here, inshallah. Wa jazakumullah khair. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward everyone immensely uh, for this effort. Any mistakes were for myself and shaitan and shortcomings. That which was correct was as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please do go back and watch the videos diligently. Any questions, feel free. May Allah reward you.